Hey everybody, welcome to CAF World War II, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. World War II is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird movement more than 65 years ago. And thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. Good evening and welcome everyone. This is episode number 130 of Warbird Tube. And tonight we take an up close look at the SBD Dauntless Dive Bomber under the care of Air Base Georgia. But before we get started, please do us a favor. If you haven't already done so, please take a second to like, share, or subscribe, and follow us. And if you do subscribe on YouTube, click on that bell icon and you'll get notifications about uh, new episodes of Warbird Tube when they go live. And if you already clicked the button and you've already followed us, thank you. Uh, we really do appreciate it. You know, if you'd like more information about the Commemorative Air Force, any of our local units, or any of our aircraft, you know, or just maybe join the fun and become an, a CAF member, please visit commemorativeairforce.org. All the information is there, and uh, we'll get you set up, and uh, you can become one of us. You can become a colonel in the Commemorative Air Force. So joining us now is CAF historian Brad Pilgrim, and uh, Brad's going to take a look back at um, a very interesting airplane in our fleet, and that is the uh, CAF's SBD Dauntless. Brad, good to have you back. Hey, Steve, it's good to be here. So uh, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the history of this airplane. We've, we've, many people have seen it today in its, its current paint scheme and restored and everything else, but it uh, has a pretty, uh, pretty long and interesting history before it ever got to CIF. It does, um, and th this, this airplane is actually the second airplane that the CF has owned, the second Nautilus the CF has owned. Oh. Uh, the first one is this one in this picture, and there's only about two pictures I've ever seen of this airplane. It came to Mercedes in uh, 1965. The CF looked at it and said, we're going to buy the airplane, and then it went on to Brownfield, uh, Brownwood, Texas, which is where they kept a lot of airplanes at the time, and the guy, we hadn't bought it yet, we were fixing to. And the guy delivering it, uh, the owner, had a stall spin accident and destroyed the airplane. And so we lost our first Dauntless before we actually got our first Dauntless. But I put this picture in here so people know this is the second one we've owned, but it's really the first one we've operated. Uh, if you go to the next picture, our Dauntless that we have right now, um, it was built in El Segundo, California by Douglas in 1944, went to the Navy. Uh, basically, it was just a squadron hack. That's all it was, just stateside. It never went overseas that we can tell. Um, it was sold as uh, stricken off inventory in 1947, and uh, War Assets Administration put it up for sale. It went to an organization that used it for skywriting, but it was so expensive fuel burn-wise that it didn't do that very long. And then it ended up being sold to Mexican and uh, Aerophoto Company down in Mexico. And what they did, they used it for aerial photography, and they used a couple of Dauntlesses, two, maybe, maybe even three of them. Uh, they did a lot of work for, like, PMEX and, and uh, the Department of the Interior and Department of Agriculture. They did stuff for National Geographic. Um, a lot of the famous pictures that you see of, of national monuments in Mexico, the pyramids and all that kind of stuff down there, that was all taken by this company. May or may not have been the Dauntless. But nearly all the pictures that National Geographic published in the 50s and 60s that were in Mexico were taken by this company. So there's a good chance that Eric Dauntless has done that kind of stuff. Um, in 1966, it came back to the U.S. This is what it looked like when it arrived uh, with the Mexican registration on it. Uh, Ed Maloney at the uh, Plains of Fame Museum uh, wound up with it. Um, it had gone through Frank Tallman and Paul Mance had owned it for a little while along with another Dauntless. And so it, it had, you know, a few other owners in between there, but nobody operated it. In fact, the first time it was annualed and put on the American registry uh, with an end number and all that was in 1971. That's when the first annual was done and transferred it over to the American registry. And I know that because I'm not only the records show up, but I've got the very first logbook to this airplane. And it has the guy who signed it off in uh, June 18th of 1971. And that's after it was purchased wow. by Bob Griffin, who donated it to the CAF. And he has this long list of all the stuff that he had to do to it. And it included the arrival inspection and, and the uh, confirmation of the airplane meeting the type certificate. Because it's not an experimental airplane. It's a type certificated 
airplane because it's a SBD-5. So it is a, a, a limited category airplane. So all that really changes is kind of the way you document the maintenance and some of what you can operate it with. But that stops them from operating the dive flaps today in flight. If you have an experimental Nautilus, you can operate the dive flaps um, with a, with a uh, limited category when you can't. Anyway, uh, March 4th of 1971, Bob Griffin, who's a well-known, famous CAF guy, he bought this and the Helldiver, both from uh, Ed Maloney at the Plains of Fame in Chino. And Bob Standish and Bruno Gronowski went out to Chino and spent several weeks getting the two airplanes flying. And I can't remember which one got flown back to Texas first. I, I don't remember which one it was. But I know Gerald, on 25th of July of 71, that's when Gerald did the first test flight of this Dauntless. And as far as I can tell, when it arrived from Mexico, this is the first time that airplane had flown. So nearly 10 years of just sitting in various places in California. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it flew at some point, but I, I can't tell for sure. Um, go to the next slide. Wait, be, before, we, before we go to the next slide, is there, do you have any clue what the airplane is behind it? Obviously, that one behind like her, no, that looks like a yeah. that looks like a farming biplane. Maybe I know yeah, at one. If like you that. ever read that old Frank Tallman book, Flying the Old Planes, he has it's a great book, and he has a farming in there that I think wound up in Australia, okay. and that kind of looks like it. But yeah. I I don't know because I don't know exactly. That's a Bill Larkin's picture, but I don't know exactly where that was taken at. I'm not sure. Pretty interesting. But it's right after it came back from Mexico. Yeah. All right, it is go. interesting. I'd never noticed that behind there. So the airplane, when it was set in a Chino, it was it was you know taken out of the Mexican colors and painted. You know, it ended up this is just a primer color, obviously, but it, it ended up being painted just a generic blue paint job. If you go to the next slide. Um, you'll see this is kind of what it kind of what it ended up as in the CF. It was just kind of a, a generic blue and white battle of midway style paint job. And if you see on the leading edge of the wing there. It has 14 right there in front of the landing gear, and it had 814 on the side of the fuselage. And I don't know what that, I don't know what that corresponded to, but I do know that the official history of the CEF is it corresponded to a guy's airplane that it doesn't correspond to. That I do know. So that's the first paint job that the airplane had after the CEF bought it, which is essentially the same as it had for years. But if you go to the next slide. You see, um, it's basically just a color picture of it. Well, this this was taken prior to 1975. And one of the things that I've been trying to do is figure out a way to date pictures of CF airplanes based on the paint schemes. Because like Fifi, you can date the airplane year of the photo within a few months based on the paint or lack thereof, based on the turrets, the number that are missing, the which direction they're facing, all kinds of stuff like that. Some of the other airplanes are a little harder. The Dauntless... Uh, that, that 14 on the leading edge, that came off in 1975, in, in very early May of 75. So this picture was taken sometime before that. If you go to the next picture, and the reason for that is this man right here. This is a guy named Admiral Ralph Cousins. And uh, during World War II, he was an SBD pilot off of the Lexington. And he was one of the guys who dropped a bomb on the Shoho, one of the Japanese carriers. It was actually the first Japanese carrier ever sunk during the war by the U.S. Thirteen bombs and 17 torpedoes, I think, from Devastators and, and uh, Dauntlesses hit the ship. It finally sunk on May 6th of 1942 in the Battle of the Coral Sea. And uh, their Lieutenant Commander Robert Dixon was the guy who was the lead uh, SBD pilot. He's the guy who transmitted the famous message "Scratch One Flat Top," which became, you know, became a news headline all over the country. It became the name of documentaries. It became the name of books. That was based on Dauntless's attacking the Shoho and sinking it and everything. But anyway, Admiral Cousins he wound up uh, during Vietnam. He was the uh, basically in charge of all carrier operations for the Navy. Um, it. Uh, he wound up being the vice uh, chief of staff of the Navy, of uh, uh, vice commander of the Navy, whatever. I uh, forgot what the actual name of the guy is, uh, what his job. In the Air Force, it would be the assistant chief of staff. But I can't remember what you call him in the, in the Navy. But anyway, he ended up doing that. And had a lot of neat jobs and all that. And in 1975, he was commander of the Atlantic Fleet. And he had his change of command and gave the command over to Admiral Isaac Kidd. And he retired. And 
when he did that, the CAF, the Navy contacted him. If you go to the next slide, they painted the Dauntless up in his colors and brought it over to the Lexington or to the uh, Nimitz and loaded it upon the Nimitz. This picture was taken a little bit later, but this shows you the paint scheme that it went into with the 2B4. And then it's kind of hard to tell, but up there with the with the rising sun on the nose there that has his name, and then it has the Shoho written underneath it, and uh, then all the names of the sponsors and all that. But if you go to the next picture, but but or the again, next before slide. we go, <laughs> that, yeah. that picture is absolutely amazing. I mean, I, I love the Dauntless, but obviously it's sitting next yeah. to the Corsair. But when you look back at what all the different aircraft that are in the background there, it's uh, it's uh, that, it's, it's that, quite a collection. That picture is classic. I mean, you can. There's the 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 Heinkel when it first arrived yeah. back there. Um, uh, the CFS P40 number 26 before it was repainted, and it was repainted like in 1975 or 76. So I think yeah. this picture is probably Air Show 75, October 75. Lefty Gardner's P38 yeah. and his P51 named Thunderbird are sitting there. Uh, a lot, of, a lot of neat airplanes in that picture, including the statics yeah. back there on the. But you can tell exactly where that was on the ramp at Harlingen if you ever went there. The hell diver beside it in its original markings. Rudy yeah. Frasca's P40 over there. The P39 beside it. That's that's a neat picture. Yeah, yeah. and Iron Annie way in the back. Yeah. yeah. Good stuff. Yep, it is neat. But this is what the airplane looked like. You know, kind of doesn't have the sponsors on the side of it there. It's got the tail hook put on it and all this kind of stuff. They put all this authentic on equipment on it that it didn't have when it came back from Mexico. If you go to the next slide, that's uh, Larry Irvin in the back seat and Ed Messick in the front seat. And they took the airplane over to get it to the Nimitz. And contrary to what has been reported, they did not land it on the Nimitz. They did not do an arrested landing on the Nimitz. Now, in 1987... Howard Pardue and uh, Tommy Gregory, I believe, did take the airplane off of the Lexington. They did a launch off of the Lexington, obviously with no catapult, for the filming of that TV series, War and Remembrance. I think they did that two or three times. That would make Howard Pardue and Tommy Gregory be the last two Dauntless pilots to go off of a carrier, as far as I know. So, But that's that's Ed Messick, who, you know, well-known mm -hmm. in the CAF, a big mover and shaker in the CAF, and... Larry Irvin, they're both no longer with us now. But you can see where it says Shoho underneath underneath the ship that has the carrier painted on the nose underneath the star, underneath the uh, flag, and then the name of the Shoho underneath it. And they did this for this retirement ceremony. So if you go to the next slide, that's them just standing beside it after they arrived. See, Ed was always smiling. They called him Smiling Ed. There's the airplane being suspended, and you can see the the Airedale's down there on the ground holding the ropes to keep it from swinging and swaying. Like I said, this is going on the Nimitz, which was a nuclear-powered carrier. It was only, I think the Nimitz was launched in 72, seems like, so it was only, mm -hmm. what, three years old and this was taken? There it is sitting up on there, sitting beside there, I mean. And this is on, I think that's on the elevator. That's after they got it on board and them getting their hero shots of them sitting on, airplane sitting in there. And this is when they're positioning it. And I, I've seen this photo. This is the original slide, but I've seen this photo in various CF uh, periodicals and stuff over the years, and it always looked different. I couldn't figure out why until the other night when I was scanning it and realized it's been printed backwards everywhere I've ever seen it until right now. This is the first time I've ever seen this. And I noticed it because the prop blades are backwards. If you look at the top prop blade, it doesn't look like it's facing the right direction, but it is. But this is the first time I've ever actually seen this picture oriented right, as far as I know. Maybe it has been otherwise. After that, it you know it did a lot of things. It, it went to uh, you know the airplane went to Transfo 72. It was used as a photography airplane. Um, it was real good as an aerial photo airplane. It kind of just beat around the CAF. It was always down there in Harlingen, and then it went to Corpus for a long time, and it got flown around and money was spent on it, but. Never a whole lot of money, just enough to keep it going. It had the same engine in it until 1981. That's when they changed the first engine. Um, it, it had a lot of hours, but they had they put about 700 hours on the airplane, flying it around in all those years. And you look back through the logbook, it's kind of a who's who of the early CEF, who flew it. You know, Vernon Thorpe, Ray Kirkpatrick, J.K. West, Frank Strickler, Hall Bond, Vince Carruth, Claire Potter, Bob Griffin. Um, Wow. A lot of people. Then there's been famous people added since then. Casey Roselle, 
you know, the world famous Casey Roselle today flies it, and then of course Chuck Gardner, you know, the the envy of all Warbird pilots, Chuck Gardner flies the Dauntless today, and Mark Todd flies it. So there's a lot of neat people have flown the airplane over the years, but at this point it was starting to look a little ragged. And uh, go to the next slide. That picture was taken in 1980. That what I do know. This is what the cockpit looked like, and this cockpit photo, I think this was 78 according to the slide, and I mean it. Doesn't look too bad, but you can tell it was not a high-dollar restoration. At this point, the airplane had never been restored. It had only been maintained, as they say. And it had a lot of problems, had a lot of hydraulic issues, had a lot of a lot of uh, wear and tear. And there was a lot of stuff on it that was worn out. And at one point, the FAA inspected the airplane and grounded it and said that the landing gear handle... There's a little detent that you have to push to move the gear handle, and they said the handle could move without being in that detent. And so the FAA wrote that up and said this has got to be fixed. And this, whoever was responsible for maintenance at the time said it was fixed, and it wasn't. So go to the next slide. You can see it sitting on its nose over here, and you know this is certainly not unique to the Dauntless. A lot of airplanes have had things like this happen. Sometimes it's just bad luck. This is a 1981 at Rockford, Illinois. It had landed and was rolling out, and the left gear collapsed completely. The right gear, I think, went partially. I don't remember. The plane wasn't hurt that bad, but it was, but it was banged up. And that kind of started a, a, a downhill slide for the airplane. They repaired it and got it back to headquarters, and then, uh, you know, it just kind of started running out of money. The, the, the way they used to do maintenance was headquarters maintained a fund for each airplane. And headquarters in Harlingen had a maintenance staff, and the maintenance guys would work on these airplanes for the sponsors or for the units or whatever, and they would just take the money out of this account. Well, when the money ran out, uh, they quit working, and they would just shove the airplane over in the corner because you know it was a big tourist destination, so a lot of you know it became a static display, and uh, all the sponsors would get called together and hey, we got to put some money into it, and then they'd throw a little at it and do a little more. Well, by this point. You know, it, by 1990, uh, it was it was in pretty bad shape, and we were knew we were fixing to have to move somewhere. And this is right before they announced to move to Midland. They knew they were going to move somewhere. Or actually, right after they announced to the move, they're like, "Well, we can't even fly the airplane." So they started making a plan to actually truck it to Midland because it wasn't flyable sitting at Harlingen. At least, I think the left wing was off of it. Might have been the right one, but I think it was the left one because they had a fuel tank out because it was leaking, had a lot of hydraulic problems. It just was a really Really a rough airplane. And at the time, they quit working on it. Um, in May May of 1990, I believe it was, they had 10 pages of write-ups that the maintenance staff at HQ had done. They had 10 completely full pages of write-ups of stuff that had to be fixed on the airplane. Some of it was little minor stuff, but some of it was fairly significant. And so the airplane was, to be generous, was very unairworthy at that point. Even if it had been put back together, it was very unairworthy. And so... It was put up for assignment. Go to the next slide. And so that, you know, the, the, that's about what it looked like. It was just really rough. It had been really abused and, and not well taken care of. Like the interior, the, the gunner's ring and seat and all that stuff in the back had been taken out. Uh, that's back in there now, but it was all taken out by over the years. And there, the back end of the airplane was empty. No original equipment in it whatsoever. A lot of the radios and stuff out of the front had been taken out. It had become kind of a part source for a lot of other airplanes in the in the hangar there in Harlingen at this point. And so in uh, March of 91, Dixie Wing down in Georgia, as they were officially known then, they put in a request to get the airplane. And one of the things I have is I've got their original request letter that they sent to headquarters. So I've got all the general staff notes from when they went through it. And I know someone else will talk about the restoration of it and what they did to the airplane. But one of the things that headquarters said, or that the general staff said, because uh, my old boss, Doug Jeans from the Kavanaugh Museum, Doug was on the general staff at the time. And I've got Doug's notes from where they said, we want the airplane to represent either the Battle of Coral Sea or the Battle of Midway, because that's really the only two things that the Dauntless is known for. And so we want it to be you know, painted in one of those representative ways. Uh, it's not. It's painted, I think it's painted in Philippine Sea markings. I can't remember now, but... My personal preference, if it was me and I was a sponsor, I'd want to go back to this markings right here that it had for all those years, Admiral Cousins colors. I just think that's really, you know, uh, classic Dauntless. 
And right now, today, you know, the the Dauntless was the most successful dive bomber in history, most successful American Navy dive bomber in history, and it sunk 300,000 tons of ships. It was the only dive bomber in production at the beginning of the war and still being used at the end of the war. You know, the Hell Diver was built to replace it and never really did because the Hell Diver, a great airplane, but it had so many teething problems, kind of like the B-29, it took it longer to come online, so the Dauntless just soldiered on till the end. The French used the Dauntless up until I think they retired their last one, like in 1953. They used them in, Indo- in Indochina, and they also used them in Algeria and Morocco in, in Africa. So the Dauntless is really, you know, a lot more... Uh, had a lot longer career than most people think it did. Today, I think there's, what, five flying, and or five that are flyable. The CF has one. The uh, World War II Museum of Aviation has one. Planes of Fame, Ericsson, and then Lone Star. They all fly, although Lone Star hasn't flown in several years. And then the Yanks Air Museum in Chino has one that they say could fly, but it hadn't flown. Pr- I don't think it. I don't think it ever flew after they restored it, so it's probably been 40 years since it's flown. So I wouldn't. I would say there's five flying ones today. Um, there's there's about 30 of them left. There were 6,000 built, so there ought to be plenty to choose from. Uh, unfortunately, the Navy owns a lot of them and won't release them. A lot of them have been recovered from Lake Michigan and stuff like that. And you know the this is it setting. This is Air Show 77 sitting at Harlingen with the Hell Diver in a rainstorm. It's kind of hard to tell there, but the rain's still falling. And I can't remember who picture that is, but it's a slide that I acquired. If you go on to the next slide. Oh, yeah, that's that's what it looked like when the Dixie Wing got it, except it was disassembled mm-hmm. at this point. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of the airplane doesn't have an exciting military history because it never had one. I'm sure it has a really cool history with the, with the Mexican photography, aerial photography company. We just don't know exactly which airplane did what. But this airplane... It's never really been, for a while, I guess it was the only flyable Dauntless in the world until Planes of Fame got theirs going again. But it's probably the most well-known Dauntless in the world because it has been flying consistently the longest. And having gone to Transpo 72 and everything and been featured and heavily photographed, it it became very well-known. And so I would wager to say it's the most photographed Dauntless of the ones that still exist today. And the Dixie Wing has done just an amazing job with it. And I've ridden in this airplane before. Uh, it's a great airplane. That is a great ride. I would encourage anybody who's interested in buying a ride to help support these airplanes. Airbase Georgia, they they always need to the help because they're doing a lot of projects, a lot of irons in the fire. But the Dauntless is not a cheap airplane to feed and house. And those guys put a lot into it, and it is well worth your money. I don't think anyone's ever come away from riding in that thing disappointed. And the people who fly it, the people who work on it, the guys who maintain it, you can't say enough good things about, you know, Airbase Georgia. And I've said before that I think they're them and the Minnesota Wing, along with several others, but those two in particular are the best examples of what a wing does away from headquarters, you know, out just in the wilds representing the CF and doing their thing. And, and they do it exceptional, and they take very good care of that airplane, and we're lucky to have it. Yeah, I agree. And we're going to take an up-close look at the airplane in its current condition and also talk with uh, Jim Buckley, who has flown the airplane before, and uh, along with some of the other aircraft if, with uh, Airbase Georgia. He'll give us a little compare and contrast between those. But right now, let's uh, get an up-close look at uh, what the Dauntless looks like. We see it, what it was like when it went to the Dixie Wing, now Airbase Georgia. Yeah. And now let's take a look at what it looks like today. Thanks, Brad. You bet. There's Jim. Hey, Jim Buckley joining us now from uh, Airbase, Georgia. Jim, glad to have you on the show tonight. Well, thank you. <laughs> so there we go. We got a pretty in-depth history on on the uh, on the Dauntless, and um, you've been with uh, Dixie Wing for for a number of years. When did you uh, first first join up with CAF and, and uh, Airbase, Georgia? Now, well, I uh, actually don't remember when, but it was well, <laughs> well back in the uh, in the nineties. Uh, they the CAF the Dixie Wing at that time was headquartered in my buddy's hangar, oh. and we were we were flying his Kate replica, and so I'm just kind of blending into the fold, you, you might say. Good. What was your uh, first exposure to the uh, Dauntless? Well, I was there when it arrived in yeah. pieces. Okay. And uh, were you in, involved in the in the restoration as well? 
Uh, I was still working full time okay. and it was kind of hit and miss what I could do to help. All right. The, and Brad's description of it, is that, that pretty accurate as, as to how the airplane ended up uh, at Air Base Georgia? Yes, it, it was in pretty rough shape. It was a... Go ahead. Go ahead. How many years did it take, if you remember, uh, to get it back in air with you? Well, it, it flew, first time it flew again was in 99. Okay. So that was at least an eight-year restoration. Eight years, yeah. Good. And uh, Jim, what's what's your background in aviation? Oh, just about any kind of airplane you, you could think of, from a stretch DC-8 to a, a Ronca. Okay. It's all, all civilian, no military. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, Jim, when was the, the first time you got to fly this airplane? It was July of 1999. Okay. And uh, how about, uh, what, what was the what was the checkout like for that? Oh, uh, checkout wasn't wasn't too bad. Uh, Mike Retke, who was one of the main restorers of the airplane, he also restored the uh, SBD that's on the carrier down uh, in Savannah. Okay. Uh, he uh, he, we went up and flew. He, uh, I flew about twenty minutes from the back seat, and we came back in, and I got in the front seat, and that was it. There you go. And you've got quite a few hours in this airplane already, don't you? Yes, I do. I have about 435 hours. My goodness. We were, we were talking before we came on the air, and, and uh, you, you may be the highest time uh, dauntless pilot that's, uh, that's around. I, I would think even even during the war, I don't think anybody would have come close to that, that many hours of uh, flight time. Well, it, it was, a, was a patrol airplane. They did fly right. some pretty long missions in it. Uh, a lot of my time is... 30 minutes at a hop given rides. <laughs> Any idea uh, how many uh, how many rides you've given? Oh, it's probably up in at least 200 rides. Okay. Good. Are any of those, I'm sure they, they all have, are special memories, but any of those that uh, stand out among others? Well, the ones that really stand out are were the, unfortunately, the new guys don't get to do it, but mm -hmm. I flew a lot of World War II veterans. Pilots and and gunners, mostly gunners. The uh, gunners were about a year or two younger than the pilots. Okay. Well, we're looking at uh, the picture right now with the uh, the dive brakes, and as, as Brad mentioned in in his uh, section, um, you're not able to deploy those in flight. But uh, I'm sure those in, on the ground here uh, generate a lot of a lot of questions from people. We normally put the dive brakes out uh, when we display the airport. Uh, they, we have a hydraulic valve that we close uh, once we stow them where they cannot be in, uh, used in flight. Okay. That was a, pr a pretty complicated operation uh, to, to extend the dive brakes. Uh, pretty complex for uh, for World War II technology, wasn't it? Well, it was hydraulically it's pretty complex, but as far as the pilot was concerned, it was pretty simple. They just flipped a switch and everything happened, right? Well, they didn't have that many switches. It was a lever, and you, okay. had, you had two levers. If you want to adjust the bottom flaps to come out, the landing flaps, you push one lever. If you wanted the dive brakes to come out, you pulled another lever, and then both the upper and lower surfaces extended. Oh, okay. Neat. Uh, one of our... Uh... One of the folks in the audience tonight is asking a question. It says, uh, in the photos, um, the, I guess the last photo that we saw uh, in Brad's section, it looks like the landing gear struts are not perfectly aligned. The right main looks to be more vertical than the left. Is that an optical illusion, or was that something that needed to be fixed on the airplane as well? <laughs> no, they, it's an optical illusion. Both, okay. both of them, neither one of them are vertical. They both okay. extend out about 10 degrees. Okay, let's see if we can find out photo here that kind of shows that. Oh, there we go. Yeah, okay. I, I, we're looking at one uh, uh, airplane's on a short final right now. And yeah, if when you look at it, it looks like they're a little misaligned, but uh, I think that just is uh, an optical illusion for the airplane. Well, and the landing gears doors are at a different angle also, so that kind mm -hmm. of throws you off. Okay. Were there any any like quirks to flying the airplane that, that you found that was not similar to other, you know, like a T6 or something like that, something that was a little different about the uh, Dauntless? 
Well, the ergonomics of it, the controls are, they're not well designed because on, if you have your left hand on, on the throttle on takeoff and your right hand on the stick, and when you go to retract the gear, you have to take your hand off the throttle, put it on the stick, and use your right hand to retract the gear and activate the hydraulics. So it's kind of not well designed in that respect. T6 is much better, but the T6 is a, is a much harder airplane to fly. Oh, it is. Oh yeah, yeah. The the SPD is a very very nice flying airplane. What uh, what makes it uh, easier or nicer to fly than the the T6? Well, the gear is spaced wider. It doesn't have the tricky characteristics of trying to want to tail chase itself. It's a, it's very stable. It's got a lot of dihedral on the wings. Uh, it's got great big ailerons. It has slots in the leading edge of the wing in front of the ailerons, which uh, of course it's a Douglas airplane. And interestingly enough, those slots were carried over into the DC-8 jets. They were Douglas's leading edge devices. So it's very maneuverable and a high crosswind. Awesome. Well, and you've also flown uh, the uh, Mustang, uh, Red Nose. Yes. How, did the, how does that compare to uh, the Dauntless? I mean, I, I realize it's a little, Dauntless is a little bigger and a different different mission, but uh, maybe a little compare and contrast between the two. Well, just like day and night. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the SBD is a 1930s designed airplane. It's got a big, big fat wing. The Mustang's got a laminar flow wing, very sleek, high performance, completely different types of engines. Uh, Mustang is a, is a beautiful flying airplane, uh, but it doesn't land as good as the SPD. SPD is one of the, one of the sweetest landing airplanes I've ever flown. With the uh, with the restoration of the airplane, uh, Brad had mentioned that the uh, the gun ring and the, the back seat had all been changed, and that's all all back to uh, original specifications now. We actually, the the men in our machine shop manufactured that entire stuff from scratch from the blueprints. Wow. Yeah, we understand you've got a talented uh, bunch of folks down in that machine shop there in uh, in Peachtree. We do. <laughs> Jim, what are some of the other things that uh, stand out to you uh, as you've been flying the uh, the Dauntless around? It's just it's a pretty reliable airplane. Uh, it's got a right engine in it instead of a Pratt and Whitney, but uh, somehow we've been able to keep it running. We did lose an engine in it at one time, almost lost the airplane. The engine seized in flight, but the pilot managed to get it down on a grass strip and. Uh, without any major damage. Uh, right now, this is the engine's on there is the best it's ever run. It's uh, quite reliable. You know, um, it, we know that the uh, the Dauntless was uh, the, the frontline dive bomber at the beginning of World War II, and then the uh, the uh, SB-2C came along, was supposed to replace it, but uh, it didn't, didn't quite replace it. The, the, the Dauntless served all throughout World War II, but um, aside from the obvious differences of, of size, what are maybe some of the other differences between the, the two dive bombers, between the, the Dauntless and the Hell Diver? Well, the Hell Diver with the folding wings is a very much more complicated aircraft. And most of the pilots that I flew that were World War II veterans uh, liked the Dauntless much better than the Hell Diver. Those that converted to the Hell Diver said they wanted their Dauntlesses back. <laughs> It had a Hell Diver had a very high wing loading on it, which uh, made it not quite the best airplane for a carrier. But uh, I guess the SPD must have spoiled them. <laughs> must have been. Hey Jim, we, we've lost your camera. Could you try uh, turning your camera on and off again? I don't know. It just says it's paused. There we go. Okay. <laughs> now you're back. All right. Sorry. Ah, it's okay. So uh, with the uh, did you ever have an opportunity to either fly or fly in the, the uh, CAF's Helldiver? No, I haven't. Okay. So, any desire to? <laughs> no. <laughs> no? <laughs> You're going to stick with the Dauntless. That's right. I love my Dauntless. 
Well, with the, uh, you, you said you've got over 400 hours on, on the airplane. Do you have, uh, and this is kind of a trivia question for you, but any idea how many uh, hours are, are the uh, Airbase Georgia has put on the airplane since they uh, took assignment back in the 90s? Uh, I just have to guess, but I would probably guess somewhere around 1,500. Wow, that, that's a that's a that's been a workhorse for uh, for Airbase Georgia, hasn't it? We ever since we started the rides program, mm -hmm. uh, we we really used this airplane to the to fu its fullest extent, and it's, it's very popular, especially with the World War II veterans. Sure. And when you uh, take it to an air show or an aviation gathering or something, uh, what are some of the uh, craziest questions people have asked you about the airplane? Well, one of the most frequent ones we get is, how did you get that airplane here? <laughs> we flew the damn thing. <laughs> we didn't bring it in on a truck. <laughs> okay, and uh, one of our uh, audience members wants to know when you're, when you're landing it, are you going uh, three-point or wheel landings? Actually, it makes a beautiful three-point landing. Okay. Uh, um, out of 10 landings, eight of them will probably have the tail wheel touch down first. Oh, okay. Nice. Uh, let's see, one of our other questions. Um, Airbase Georgia has a Corsair as well. Do you think, yeah, it's <laughs> a good one. Do you think the uh, SBD plays second fiddle to the Corsair or uh, are they uh, they're kind of equals? Uh, it depends on the individual. Of course, of course, there's a wonderful airplane, and mm -hmm. everybody's watched Baba Black Sheep. Right. There's no program on the SBD to support it. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you watch the Battle of Midway, right? Right. <laughs> and poor old Charlton Heston, I wish he'd have made it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Have you have you flown the Corsair as well? No, I haven't. Okay. But the Mustang and the yeah, obviously the T6 and the uh, the Dauntless. Any other uh, airplanes in the Airbase Georgia that uh, you've got some time in? Um, mostly the T6. Okay. Uh, I owned one of my, my myself for, and instructed in it for about 15 years. All right. What what uh, what do you have for total time these days? Uh, my time? Yeah. I have about 24,000 hours. Okay. <laughs> so, a relatively experienced pilot, I guess we can call you, right? Yeah, I'm not not too green. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, any other uh, thoughts that you have on uh, flying the Dauntless or actually any of the Warbirds or, or even on uh, Air Base Georgia? It's just a, to me, it's a very big honor to fly them and an, another honor to be a, a check pilot on them mm -hmm. to check out most of the newer guys, the the young 50 year old kids and and pass on what I know about the airplane. And speaking of what you know about the airplane, are the are the cockpit layouts similar in the torpedo bombers, like the, the TBM, the uh, Hell Diver, and the and the Dauntless? Are they relatively the same, or are they different? No, the Dauntless is the very earliest of them, mm -hmm. and it was they didn't have this idea of where to put your hands very good. Um, so the other ones are are a little better coordinated. Okay. Yeah, as you mentioned earlier, having to do, switch hands just to be able to raise the gear. That's correct. <laughs> sort of like the uh, the very first, the Wildcats, right? Where you had to uh, uh, crank the gear up by hand. <laughs> right, right. Not, not well, not very ergonomically uh, savvy in, in those days. Yeah, the first time I, I uh, ra raised the gear in a Dauntless, my mind was saying, why is it getting quiet? Because with my left hand off of the throttle, it just creeped back. So it was coming coming back to idle power without realizing it, except for the for the sound. Yeah. And of course, it just reach over and push it back up. It's fine, but it's just like, whoa. <laughs> Do you know if that was the if that was a challenge for World War II pilots as well? Um, most of the guys got pretty good training in the T6. Okay. If you can handle a T6, you could probably handle any airplane on the line. You had mentioned that uh, you you've uh, had the opportunity to fly a lot of a lot of veterans and uh, you know Dauntless crew members, uh, and uh, I'm assuming there were some pilots that uh, SBD pilots that you flew as well. That's correct. Yeah. What were their impressions or memories uh, of of flying again with you in in their old airplane? Uh, it was it's a very wide spectrum. I remember um, 
one of the guys I worked with at a company, his father-in-law was a gunner on the Dauntless. Mm -hmm. And they actually, uh, they thought they were goners. They had a the cowling blown off, a cylinder blown off. It was barely running and they were trying, trying to get back to the carrier. They were gonna try to ditch alongside it, but somehow they made it up on the deck. And as soon as they got the crew members out, they just pushed the airplane overboard. And this particular gentleman, that was the last time he was in a Dauntless until one cool January morning, his son-in-law surprised him, came up on the airplane. We had this all pre-planned and just said, hey, I heard someone got some old airplanes over. Let's go see what they got. And he had already purchased him a ride on the Dauntless. Mm -hmm. And this, this gunner didn't say a word. He walked around that airplane for 30 minutes. He couldn't decide whether he was going to get in it or not. But he finally did. And yeah, I pretty sure he enjoyed it. Good. The uh, as we saw on the on the graphic that, that was promoting our, our webinar tonight, uh, you've given the Dauntless the uh, the nickname the Lady in Blue. Where did where did that come from? You know, I should know that, but I don't. <laughs> Other than the blue, blue paint job. We had a lady that wrote a poem about it, one of our members. Okay. And I, I presume it came from her. Okay. All right. Uh, John is, has got a question for us. He says, uh, I'm an aerospace engineering under, undergrad at, at Purdue University. Uh, and at school, they often get uh, caught up talking about the newer aircraft flying around, like the uh, F-35 or the uh, Grumman uh, B-21 that's under development. But uh, what can we as aerospace engineers learn from these older aircraft? Uh, what can the uh, SBD teach us that still remains, rele or remains relevant today? Well, that's a complicated well, question. It's, it's still uh, the same aerodynamics makes lift. Yeah. That's about it. <laughs> and also uh, cockpit management, right? Right. Do, do it right this time. <laughs> Well, Jim, we've cleaned up all the questions that we have from from our audience tonight, and uh, we'll let you uh, get back to your Wednesday evening. But uh, we want to say thank you to you and uh, everybody at Airbase Georgia for uh, sharing the this beautiful airplane with us. Any uh, final thoughts before we wrap up? Yeah, uh, we're just very proud of it. All right, and uh, keep watching for it. You guys will be uh, hopping rides uh, both at uh, Airbase Georgia and at uh, shows around the country as well. Yep, we do. Uh, we do. Uh, uh, Reading, Pennsylvania every year, and we do Oshkosh every year. All right. We'll look for you out there on the air show circuit. That's right. All we'll right. Jim, Jim Buckley from Airbase Georgia joining us tonight to talk a little bit about the uh, SBD Dauntless, and uh, we thank him for uh, for sharing his insights with us tonight. By the way, if you have uh, questions or feedback for our uh, our shows, just send an email to Leah Block at media at CAFHQ. Dot org. Don't forget to uh, subscribe and like and uh, click that bell icon if you uh, follow us on YouTube and you'll know when we get uh, new episodes of Warbird Tube uh, posted up. So thank you again for joining us. Until next time, I'm Steve Buss and this is CAF Warbird Tube.